Chapter 21 deals with environmental issues in real estate, and really we're talking about uh, residential environmental issues mostly, like we all most often are when we talk about uh, issues in this class. It's almost always residential. We, we do very little focus on commercial, primarily because commercial uh, clients uh, generally are a little bit more educated in the process. They don't need as much guidance from their agents. Um, the law doesn't protect them quite as much as it does residential clients, either in leases or in purchases. So Chapter 21 deals with you know some things that are sort of known issues when it comes to residential um, uh, environmental issues. Um, so it's something that is continuously growing in uh, importance for us as brokers because it's something that we see much more often in our day-to-day -day business. Um, and it is something that we have to accurately disclose if there are environmental issues that are present in the property. I'm going to try to focus on the things that are most often tested from this chapter. Again, this is much like the um, a chapter on basic home construction that there's not a lot of information here and it'll go pretty quickly. Uh, the first hazardous substance that we're going to focus on, and this is just sort of a list of all of them that uh, could be found, or all the ones at least that we focus on in the class, but the first one we want to spend some time on is something called asbestos. And asbestos has been around for a, a very long time. Uh, it, it used to be considered to be a miracle product almost. It was in everything. It was in gloves. It was in insulation. It was in glue that might glue down tiles on floor. It was in brake linings on cars. Uh, you name it, and it probably had asbestos in it um, because it was very good at uh, insulating and reducing friction and it held up well under intense heat, all those kinds of things that were desirable properties. Well, what we learned over time with asbestos is that it can be very harmful to your health um, if it breaks down. If it starts to break up and break down, um, then it can be extremely hazardous to your health. It causes lung cancer um, because of the particles. So let's talk about when asbestos becomes harmful. First of all, 1978 is sort of a, a very keynote year when it comes to environmental issues because uh, in 1978, two very notable things were outlawed in the use in their use in residential construction. Both asbestos and lead-based paint uh, are no longer used in residential construction, and that has been the case since 1978. So that year is worth remembering. Um, since 1978, residential construction has not contained either asbestos or lead-based paint. Uh, but there were about 3,000 different products uh, used in the building industry prior to 1978 that did contain asbestos. So if you sell a home or show a home that was built prior to that time period, it's almost 100% certainty that you're going to see some asbestos or come in contact with asbestos. Um, the, the key here is to understand the difference between asbestos that's in good condition and what we call friable asbestos. That's the word that we really want to focus on, friable, F-R-I-A-B-L-E. Friable just means breaking down. It means it's breaking down into small, easily airborne particles. Um, as asbestos starts to crumble, little tiny, almost microscopic particles start to break off and they become airborne. And they get lodged in your lungs or in the lining of your lungs. Um, and if you've ever sort of had um, fiberglass insulation on your skin and experienced that really itchy feeling that comes along with that from those fibers becoming embedded in your skin, well, think of asbestos as doing the same thing but in your lungs. Um, so when you have asbestos uh, breaking down, it can be extremely dangerous because it does cause that irritation of the, the lining of the lungs and can eventually lead to uh, things like lung cancer or mesothelioma you may have heard of before. Um, there are two ways to deal with asbestos as far as uh, remediation. Remediation just means eliminating the threat. And there are a couple ways you can do that. The first is called encapsulation. 
Encapsulation means sealing up the asbestos or the contaminant, in this case asbestos, um, so that humans can't come into contact with it. Um, so when you encapsulate something, you basically just seal it off from any access to um, those who might be harmed by it. Um, so exactly, what does that mean in a residential construction? Um, well, maybe there's asbestos in a certain part of the attic. Can we seal off that part of the attic so that people cannot uh, gain access to it any further? Um, it, if so, then it's very possible that we can create a situation where they don't have to actually remove the asbestos. If we can seal it off or encapsulate it, then that's one method of dealing with it. The other of course, is removal. And to remove asbestos, um, it's a fairly involved process that deals with, number one, wetting it. And, you know, obviously when you talk about wetting something in a, in a, inside a building, you're going to create some issues there. Um, there. There's other damage created just as a result of the removal process. So it's very expensive to deal with removal of asbestos. Um, but know that word friable, and uh, you'll be good to go on asbestos as far as your knowledge for the test. Lead-based paint. A little bit more information here. Um, lead was very commonly used in a lot of uh, household uh, chemicals prior to 1978. It was used in plumbing. Um, it was used in... Um, some electrical fixtures, it was definitely used in paint. Um, lead helped the paint to have a, a better adherence and to last longer. Um, and so it was used very extensively in paint. Uh, that was banned in 1978, sort of like asbestos was banned in 1978. Um, lead poisoning is a serious condition that can damage the brain, nervous system, kidneys, red blood cells, etc. But it especially is very dangerous for children. Um, children are very susceptible to lead poisoning. And so it's children that we're primarily concerned with when we talk about lead-based risk in a residential property. So how do we handle um, the potential for lead-based paint? Um, when we are dealing and selling properties that were built prior to 1978. If you look in your book on 468, you'll see the Residential Lead-Based Paint Hazard Reduction Act, um, which is a fancy name for a law that came about and essentially said, number one, it's illegal to use lead-based paint in residential properties. That was the first part. But it also said that if a residential property was being sold that was built prior to 1978, then real estate brokers and sellers and landlords had an obligation to disclose to potential buyers or tenants that the property might have lead-based paint. Not that it does. I'm going to repeat that. You, you are disclosing that the property might have lead-based paint. You don't have to disclose that it does. Now, if you know for sure that it does, you have to disclose it. But there's no requirement that you find out if there is lead-based paint in the property. The, the law simply requires you to, to disclose, hey, this property is built before 1978, therefore it might have lead-based paint. And in addition to that disclosure, the law requires you to give any buyer or tenant 10 days to inspect for themselves. Now, very often, the tenants, the, the buyers, choose not to do that inspection, and that's entirely up to them. But you have to provide that, that time opportunity. And if they find a lead-based paint issue during that 10 days, then you have to allow them to back away from the contract without any kind of a penalty. Um, so key here is the disclosure is mandatory in the sense that you have to tell them the property was built before 1978 and it might have lead-based paint. But there's not a mandatory disclosure of 
yes or no, there's lead-based paint or there's not lead-based paint. We never are put to that much of a requirement simply because we don't have to find out. We just have to let them know so that they can check if they so choose. Um, there is an addendum that you're required. And remember, addendums or addenda are things that are added to contracts. The first three letters, add, A-D-D. They add to contracts. So there is an addendum that's used when you are either selling or leasing a property built prior to 1978, if it's a residential property. If it's a commercial property, you don't have to worry about this. Again, commercial tenants and commercial uh, buyers are not given some of the same protections that residential buyers are given. So... Um, this is only if it's residential. But if it is residential and if it was built before 1978, you need to make sure that you are making that disclosure. Hey, the property was built before 78. It could have lead-based paint. And there's also an addendum that you're required to give to that buyer or tenant that states exactly what knowledge the seller or landlord does have about lead-based paint. It could be that they know nothing. They could check on the on the form you know, we have no knowledge. Or maybe they do know, and they could check on the form. We're sure the property's free of lead-based paint. But you have to provide the form, and you have to provide the 10-day inspection period. Now, how do you deal with lead-based paint if it's there? Same way, the same two methods that you deal with asbestos. Either encapsulation or removal. Encapsulation or removal are going to be your two methods for dealing with the, this lead-based paint hazard. Encapsulation is much easier. Just paint over it. That's honestly the easiest solution for lead-based paint. If you paint over it, you've encapsulated it, the threat is therefore sealed up, and you don't have to worry about it as an active threat. Removal is a little bit trickier because like asbestos, lead becomes airborne when you break it down. So when you start to do demolition or sanding or tearing things out on a home built prior to 1978, you could release air particles or lead particles into the air, and that can require different types of removal. The next environmental contaminant that we want to talk about is radon. Radon is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas that is naturally found literally everywhere all around us all the time. And it causes cancer. I know that's a reassuring thought. But the, the truth is that it's only been found to cause cancer in very high concentrations, and we just generally don't come into contact with it in high concentrations because it very quickly uh, dissipates once it gets above ground. Radon emanates up from the ground and uh, comes from the breakdown of radioactive um, material that's in the ground. And um, it's found all over the country. Once it gets above ground, though, it dissipates very quickly. The problem we have with it in real estate is that homes are increasingly better insulated and more sealed up as time goes on. The, the further we go forward in time, the more you see homes that are just not open to the outside air. And that has put more pressure on um, the ability of the environment to dissipate this radon in um, newer construction in a lot of cases. Uh, older homes could have issues too, but generally um, older homes are so poorly insulated and have so much air flowing through them all the time that you don't see as much of an issue. But newer homes are more sealed up and can concentrate this radon gas. So here's what you need to be aware of. There is a federal uh, action level. Uh, that Now, some people call it the safe level, and that's not really the accurate way to, to refer to it because uh, the EPA officially says, the Environmental Protection Agency officially says there is no such thing as a safe level for radon. But uh, they set this action level, which is four picocuries per liter of air, um, as an undesirable level. In other words, if your measurement of radon is above that, then you should take action. Um, 
eliminating radon or dissipating radon is as simple as installing a ventilation system. Um, and that can be done in the crawl space, can be done in the attic. Even if it's a slab home, it can be done under the slab. Um, these are not terribly expensive. You're usually looking at somewhere between $1,000 and $2,000 for most homes if they have a radon issue to install a remediation system. The test, most home inspectors will provide a radon test, and or you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot, pick up the test kits, and perform the test yourself. Very easy to test for and pretty easy to eliminate the threat. I will, I'm going to leave you with this as far as radon goes. I went to a conference years ago and um, there was a gentleman there from the EPA who was talking about radon and what an underrated threat it was. And he said that if you lived in a home with a radon level of six picocuries, which is not all that high, honestly. I mean, I've seen ones that are 12, 13. But if you live in a home that has a, a, a radon level of six picocuries, uh, that is the equivalent lung cancer risk of being a pack and a half a day cigarette smoker. Um, so that's kind of really scary if you think about it. Um, be, and it's because you breathe the air all the time. Uh, so make sure that you're recommending your clients get these radon tests. And if they fall above that action level, that you're doing something to alleviate that issue. Right. I don't want to spend much time on urea formaldehyde because it's not something you're going to be tested on, nor is it something I've honestly ever encountered as an issue um, in an agent. Uh, it's something that's found in insulation, and it can be um, you know, broken down into potentially harmful materials. But, uh, again, I've never seen it as an issue, and you're not tested on it, so I don't want to spend a bunch of time on it. Carbon monoxide, again, a colorless, odorless gas. Um, this comes from the burning of usually fossil fuels like natural gas or propane. Could come from uh, charcoal or anything that's being burned, honestly. Uh, any, any, any open flame. That's the, uh, the, the key thing to look for with carbon monoxide risk. Is there an open flame? Remember that there may be open flames that you can't actually see in a home. If it has a gas water heater, there's an open flame. Um, if it's a gas oven, that's an open flame. So if your clients are looking at a property or purchasing a property or renting a property that has any sort of gas appliances in it or a fireplace or anything like that, please make sure that they have a carbon monoxide detector. That's a great gift that you can give them at closing um, if you like to get in on their good side. Give them a carbon monoxide detector because this, is, uh, this will kill you in your sleep in most cases. Uh, uh, you don't realize it's happening and it prevents your bloodstream from carrying oxygen so you just sort of go to sleep um, and don't wake up. So be very conscious of properties that have open flame systems um, as needing not only smoke detectors but carbon monoxide detectors as well. Um, electromagnetic fields. Uh, this has been a, a real area of intense uh, sort of controversy scrutiny. Um, there is a theory, there's a thought process that if you uh, live under um, high tension power lines then the electromagnetic fields that are generated by those power lines can cause serious health issues and, and potentially cancer. Um, there have been people that have had can clusters of those who are affected with cancer that live near these uh, high-tension power lines. And so uh, there are going to be clients that you come into contact with that are very concerned about this. The good news is that the electric providers in our area, Duke, Pro Duke Energy and Progress Energy, which are now the same company, um, as well as the cooperatives in some other areas, are all willing to come out and test for free the uh, EMF fields on your property, both inside the home and outside in the yard. Um, and they have whole, you know, they have staffs that are dedicated to do that. If you call them, they will come out. If you have clients that are overly concerned about that issue because there are power lines near the property, you can have that done. And it's usually free, again. One of the big things that we always have to worry about with residential real estate is groundwater contamination, uh, particularly if there is a well on the property, and that's going to be used as a source of drinking water. Um, so 
if your clients are going to use a well on the property, please make sure you have a well water test done. And don't let your clients skimp on that well water test. There are very different tests. There are some that only test for bacteria, but don't test for you know heavy metals that might poison the water or chemicals that might poison the water. Um, so if your your clients are buying a property that has a well and they're going to be using groundwater as a source of drinking water, please make sure they have an extensive well testing done during their due diligence period um, so that they know that that water is going to be safe for them to drink. Underground storage tanks um, has been and will continue to be, and this is on page 472 in your textbook, one of the biggest uh, sources of angst among agents and buyers uh, and, and in sellers as well. Um, these are tanks that are buried under the ground um, on these properties. They were used at one point to store maybe propane or f heating fuel oil or gasoline or some other you know fuel or some chemical whatever it was that the tank was buried to store in lots of cases these tanks have been abandoned they're no longer used they're, they're, the property's still used but the tank itself is no longer being used but it's still there that's very dangerous it's dangerous for a number of reasons number one the tanks will eventually leak. They are made of steel. Eventually they will rust and they will leak. And if they leak, they're leaking into the ground, which can contaminate groundwater. Obviously, if your clients have a well, that, that contamination can go directly into their well. But even if your clients don't have a well, that contamination can work its way into the groundwater system and contaminate hundreds of other wells that are you know, miles and miles away. So be very conscious of the need to locate these tanks and have them dealt with, whether that means remove them or pumping them out and then filling them with sand and gravel. Um, it, it can be very expensive to, uh, to deal with these things. But one of the things that you should understand is that if you own the property, you own the messes that come from the property. So your clients that own this property that have these underground storage tanks, they are responsible um, for maintaining those storage tanks. And they are responsible for paying for um, any negative things that come as a result of those tanks not being well maintained. So they need to be aware of them. If they're out there and they've been abandoned, they need to take care of them before they leak. If they take care of them before they leak, they can simply have them pumped out, filled with sand and gravel, capped off, and they'll never have to worry about it again. If they've already leaked, it's a different story. There may be some much more uh, expense involved with getting rid of that. Um, you know, on page 472 and, and 473, uh, they talk about some of the different types of tanks um, that, that might be exempt from federal regulations. You don't need to know any of those sizes as far as, you know, tanks that hold less than 110 gallons. And uh, you, you just don't need to know all those. You're not going to be tested on that. But please be aware that your clients could be held responsible for the cleanup cost um, that could come from these tanks leaking um, no matter what size they are. All right. Um, obviously, uh, landfills and waste disposal sites can be an environmental issue. If your property that you're selling uh, or that you're helping someone buy is near one of these sites, please make sure you are uh, disclosing that to them um, so that they are aware of the potential risk. I mean, you know, there's more to a landfill than the smell. Uh, there are things leaching into the ground that could contaminate groundwater. It could cause other issues. So they need to be aware that this is what's near their property. Make sure you are dis disclosing that, um, you know, if they're buying near a landfill or some sort of other waste disposal site um, uh, because they, they, those are going to be huge disclosure issues for you. Uh, obviously, there are rules that govern the, the monitoring of these kinds of sites, but, uh, um, you know, you, the biggest thing as a broker for you to be aware is the disclosure piece. Just make sure you're disclosing it. It is a material fact. It needs to be disclosed. 
Um, mold on page 475. Mold comes in all kinds of shapes, sizes, colors, types, danger levels. Uh, you name it, mold probably comes in a variety of it. Um, some of them are harmless. Some of them are very harmful. You will not be able to tell the difference between harmless mold and harmful mold by looking at it. If you see mold, if you suspect mold, you get an expert over there to evaluate that mold and to determine what kind of an issue it is, how much of an issue. Is it dangerous? Does it need to be removed? If so, what's going to be the removal process for having it taken out of that property? Um, there are lots of rules and regulations that go along with the cleanup of mold. Um, you know, But as a broker, if you see it, Make sure it gets evaluated. That's really what your responsibility is. Um, it, it does say here on this last bullet point, it says in North Carolina, mere presence of mold in the residence is not a material fact unless it is in excessive amounts in unusual locations or if it's dangerous. That's the other part that's not on that slide. If you know there's a danger there. But the problem here is that um, you don't know what's dangerous and what's not when it comes to mold. So in my opinion, you probably have to have it evaluated just to, to make sure that there's nothing you need to be disclosing. Now, there's going to be some mold. I mean, there's going to be mold, you know, in crawl spaces. Some small amounts in some isolated places, you understand, especially in older homes. But if you look under that crawl space and every surface has some kind of mold on it, that's not good, and it shouldn't be that way. So make sure you're keeping an eye out for those things. Okay. On page 476 uh, and 477, uh, it details a federal law called CERCLA, the C Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Um, basically, this law created... Um, a, a fund called the Super Fund, which was designed to help clean up hazardous waste sites. One of the problems in saying to homeowners, or well, you're responsible for anything that leaks on your property, is they cannot afford the cleanup costs in a lot of cases. And so if you can't afford the cleanup costs, what do you do when someone says to you, well, you know, we, we need, you know, it needs to be cleaned up. You're responsible. And so, it doesn't do you a lot of good if they don't have the money. So this fund was created um, to help pay for those. That doesn't mean the landowner may not still get a bill, but at least there is some money to come in and help clean uh, the, the issue. They, they did also create something called innocent landowner immunity. And basically that, that, that says that if you can prove you had nothing to do with placement of the environmental issue like an underground tank and you had no idea it was there, no way to know it was there, then usually you could probably get away from being responsible. But I wouldn't take that chance. If I've got buyers and they're buying older property especially that might have these kinds of tanks, I'm going to have the yard checked to make sure that uh, the tanks aren't out there. And if you have questions about, you know, how to get somebody to check, please come, you know, ask me. Uh, at some point, but uh, it's not the hardest thing in the world to, to have the, the property checked for underground tanks. North Carolina specific laws, again, you're not going to be tested on these. Most of these are very self-explanatory. Uh, the Petroleum Underground Storage Tank Cleanup Act deals again with, that's the North Carolina version of the law that deals with underground tanks. The Coastal Area Management Act deals with the coastal areas of the property. So um, these are all North Carolina specific laws. You don't need to know anything about them necessarily other than there are several types of environmental laws that uh, might be in play at any one time uh, in North Carolina. So what's our real estate? What's our liability as brokers? Um, that's really... What we care about and at the end of the day, you know, what is our liability as a real estate broker? Well, most of the liability here is carried by the seller. Uh, and that's because they're the ones who, who have the most opportunity to be aware of the, uh, the issues that are on the property, the environmental issues that are there. However, we might be held liable for an improper disclosure. If we knew, remember the bar is always, did we know? Or could we reasonably have known? 
should we reasonably have known? And if so, then we should be disclosing. But if it's something that's completely hidden from us, and we have no way to suspect, no way to know, then that's a, a different story. You could, probably are not going to be held responsible for that. But you also need to keep your eye out. I mean, that means you need to ask questions, especially if it's an older property that you're listing for sale. You know, are there any underground tanks buried out here? Do you know? Have there ever been any? Um, you know, can we check? Those kinds of things. Um, Obviously, appraisers and insurers could be affected by this liability. Liability extends to everybody. Um, we are not expected to discover environmental hazards, but we must disclose any known contaminants. And that sort of goes back to the mold thing. We say mold is not a material fact, but it, if we know that the mold's there and we, ha we know we haven't checked to see if it's hazardous, well, then we probably haven't done enough of a job. We need to make sure that it's not hazardous so that if it is, we can disclose it. Um, that's really, I think, where it comes down for us as far as brokers on the side of liability. Um, as I said, quick chapter, 31-minute lecture. Um, there's not a lot of material there. You may see a couple questions. Really focus on asbestos and especially the lead-based paint. Make sure you know with lead-based paint that the magic year is 1978. Make sure you know that uh, any seller or landlord has to provide that lead-based paint hazard addendum when they sell or lease property that's residential and built before 1978 um, and uh, that they have to disclose that there's the potential for lead-based paint, not that it's there or not there, but that there's the potential. And they also have to give that buyer or tenant a 10-day inspection window to check for lead-based paint. Um, those are the big things to take away from this chapter. Thanks.